And I believe the Lord is speaking to us as a church today. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us with great volume, and we will do well to heed to his voice. We need to evaluate uh, where we are individually, as well where we are as a church body. Can I hear an amen? And if you remember, Laodicea was one of the richest cities in the Lycus Valley. The city was incredibly wealthy. There were rows and rows of large, beautiful columns. And if you see this, there was at least four of these that were built and with 4,500 shops. So that was their shopping center. Uh, that's what they're showing you right now. People came from all over to spend money, sell their goods, and do banking. The church of Laodicea did not suffer persecution like the Christians in the neighboring cities. They uh, were able to participate in the marketplace. They were doing so well financially that they no longer recognized their own desperate need for Jesus. Hallelujah. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And we're going to briefly go over these and then go into the last few uh, verses. The Bible says, write this letter to the angel of the church of Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen. I'm going to pause there. In the Greek, there is a definite article. It's not just an amen. Jesus is the amen. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Jesus is the amen. He is the final word on any subject. Never forget that. Jesus has the final word on any subject. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is the faithful and true witness. The beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do. That you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm... Since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You remember what it meant to spit? It meant to vomit you out of my mouth. You make me sick. Jesus wants his church to be free, refreshing like a cool drink of water on a hot summer day or a comforting like a, like a hot cup of tea in the dead of winter like the healing medicinal waters that came from Hierapolis. These people were neither. Their biggest problem was their attitude towards wealth. Say attitude. attitude. Christ continues to address them. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. There was an attitude here that doesn't translate, obviously, into the English. Because you say, you are rich. Say, I am. In the Greek, is emi, E-M-I-E. The word points to self-reliance, self-focus, self-centeredness, even self-absorption. They were all about them, and they were rich. Were they ever rich? Hallelujah. In the Greek, the word pleodicea, it is capitalized. It means vast wealth, unimaginable wealth. They said, I've done this all by myself without God's help or blessing on my life. Jesus is not against wealth or prosperity, but he is against pride and arrogance. Can I hear an amen? amen. In Deuteronomy 8, the Bible says, but you shall remember the Lord your God. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you the power to make wealth. You can't say, I did it all by myself, because it's only because God has allowed it. Amen. Amen. They said, in fact, you were so arrogant and cocky that they said, we have no need of anything. They had forgotten their need for spiritual food. And this church was in trouble. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, say with me, the Bible says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, 
and knowest. Say knowest. Knowest. Knowest not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Knowest not. And the Greek word is ook. O-O-K. It means emphatically don't get it. You don't get it. You don't comprehend. You don't see the truth about yourself. The truth is, is that you are wretched. See, God's in your face. He doesn't mince words. He just tells you the truth. How many like that? Amen. The truth sets you free. The truth is that you are mis miserable, wretched and miserable. Promotus, P-O-R-O-D-I-S. In the Greek, this is a definite article. It doesn't just mean you are calloused. It means you are the calloused ones. No one is more calloused than you. They were claiming to be the richest of all. Jesus says the truth is that you are the most calloused of all. Jesus says you are miserable, you're poor, you're blind and naked. Let's move on to Revelation 3.18. The Bible says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. The Bible says, so I counsel thee, so I advise thee. In the King James, it says, I counsel thee. In the Greek, it's sambolio. To do something jointly with someone else, this is the Greek meaning, means to advise in the context of working together as in joint counseling or a joint determination. I'm going to sit at the table with you, and I'm going to counsel you. Amen. Jesus will come to the table with anyone who's willing to listen to him. He will come to the table with you and your children. He will come to the table with your spouse and your family and your friends. Jesus will come to your church and sup with you. He will counsel with you. If you and I are willing to hear the words of Jesus, he will come to the table. Amen. I counsel. He said, I counsel you to buy gold from me. Gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so that you'll be able to see. Say ointment for the eyes. This was significant to the church of Laodicea because their town was known for having a medical treatment for eye infections. A mineral-based ice salve called filigree and powder was made in Laodicea, Laodicea, and it actually worked. Jesus tells them you need to anoint, say anoint. anoint. You need to anoint your eyes with eye salve, and he's telling them in so many different ways. You don't have everything that you think you have. So much is available to you, but you are missing it. Say anoint. anoint. Jesus said you need an anointing. You need an anointing for your eyes that you may see. See. Say see. see. In the Greek it's lepo. B-L-E-P-O. To see. It means to jar them. Their, uh, that their eyes would really be open to see the true situation. How many would like to know the truth about your situation? Open my eyes, jar my eyes that I may see. Anoint my eyes that I will see. In Revelation 3.19, he says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. If you don't correct your children, you don't love them. You, you, you know, they grow up in society. And if you've spoiled them rotten, and you've not corrected your children, it's going to be miserable not only for you, but it will be miserable for them growing up. Can I hear an amen? amen. You do them an injustice when you don't correct your children. That doesn't mean be abusive to your children. It means correct them. Train them how to clean their room. Train them how to work. Train them how to work. If 
you don't teach them how to work, how are they going to make a living? They don't like it. Pick up your toys. We're going to have chores. We had a little list on our door when the kids were growing up. They'd have to make marks. This is Gary was very <laughs> strict about that, you know. But it taught them things. And it taught them how to keep a nice home. You go to somebody else's house, they're not jumping all over the couch, uh, coloring all over the walls and stuff. You know, you want people to, you want to invite them to the other house, but if their kids are out of control, you don't want them to come to your house. Can I hear an amen? I'm just telling you the truth. I like nice things. I taught my kids to take care of our things. Amen? And if you don't want to have nice things, just have a, a romper room and let them have at it. You know what I'm saying? If you don't want to. But I had, I just was correct. I corrected my kids. Okay, I'm moving on. <laughs> I correct and discipline everyone I love. Jesus is telling us that he deals with wayward believers and churches. He loves them so much that he gets involved. Say I. I. Jesus is talking about himself. He said Jesus is drawing attention to himself. He's saying, now that I'm going to get involved, let me tell you how I deal with those who've gone astray. And Ian, E-A-N, in the Greek, say if. If, if I love. If I love, this is what I'm going to do. Jesus loves you. Isn't that wonderful? Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. Jesus loves you. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. If I love you, if I really love the church, then this is what I'm going to do. Are you ready? The Bible says, I correct. I rebuke. And the Greek for word for rebuke means to expose, to convict, or cross-examine for the purpose of conviction. Used in a positive sense to convince someone of something denotes a lawyer who worked diligently to convince people of a new way of thinking. This is what Jesus is saying. We, are, we also understand that this is the way the Holy Spirit works in our life. The same word used in John chapter 16, verse 8. The same Greek, this word he says, is to describe the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that good? And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit gives us in, in a futable proof that what we're doing is wrong and need to make a change. When he speaks, there is no mistaking of his intent. He says, I discipline. Say, I discipline. He chases. It is personal. I like it when he corrects me personally in private. I would rather him say, I'm going to give you a warning. And I'm going to have mercy on you. And we're going to do this in private. Nobody likes to get a spanking in front of everyone. Correct? Some people get it. For the whole world to see. But I like it when God does it personally. Because that's what he does. He gives you a chance to change. He knocks at your door. He says, please, just let me talk to you. Let me, let me give you a word of advice. And the Greek word, pedeo, I teach and train, to train children or anyone who, with strict discipline, to help them mature, to assist one in reaching full potential. He wants you to reach your full potential. Amen. Isn't that good? Jesus did not want the situation in Laodicea to end where it was. He wanted them to reach their full potential. Now he's going to deal with them. If Jesus corrects you, if he corrects me, it's because he wants each 
of us to reach our full potential in him. Can I hear an amen? Hallelujah. He, Jesus, is not trying to hurt you. He's trying to help you. He's trying to convict you and convince you to teach you. This word discipline or chasing really means to educate you, to lead you to your full potential. Then he says to be zealous, therefore, and repent. Say repent. Yes. The word zealous in the Greek is zelo, Z-E-L-O-O. To be heated or to boil. Enthusiasm, fervor, passion, devotion, or an eagerness to achieve something. To be deeply committed to something. Jesus said, I will do my part, but now you must do your part. You have to make a decision to hear God. You have to be zealously committed. You're going to finish what you began. Hallelujah. Say repent. Amen. The Greek word is mataneo. A change of mind that results in a complete, radical, total change of behavior. Amen. That's what I was saying this morning. Serve God. Give him 100%. You gave the devil 100%. Give God 100%. You just can't say, I gave him my time and I came to church once in a while and I maybe picked up the Bible and read a few scriptures. Didn't do much for me. You can't do it that way. You have to grow. Amen. Say grow. grow. And the Bible is your moral compass in life. This is how you grow. You know, some days you might read something and you go, oh, ouch. It's hard. I really have to be pure like that? Yes, Sherry. Who will ascend to the mountain? Who will ascend to the mountain of God? Those with what? A pure heart and clean hands. The prayers of a righteous man or woman availeth much. This is your moral compass. This is God's written voice. Open it up. Love him. He loves you so much. He loves you. I, I just, I need to express to you how much he loves you. Your life will never be the same if you give him everything. When you get married, you come to the altar. Do you halfway commit or wholly commit? Some of you halfway commit. Well, if he makes me mad, I can just divorce him. Don't even think that way. Jesus doesn't think that way when you make a covenant with him, when you come to the altar with him and you ask him to come into your life. He's making a commitment to say, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm with you to the end. That's the way he is. Even if you've been, even if you cheated on him, even if you've lied and you've done things, he said, I will still be here. You just keep coming back to me. I won't reject you. Oh, he's good. Amen. A decision to completely change or to ent entirely turn around in the way that one is thinking. That's why I said, God, change my mind. Change my heart. Believing or living a total transformation affecting every, say every, every, every part of a person's life. Well, sometimes people don't want to give up things. But you know what? Day by day. Work out your salvation Amen. with fear and trembling. Those little habits will come off. Amen. Don't feel defeated. Just work it out. Day by day. Yeah. Say, God, where I'm weak, make me strong. God, I need your help, Father. Holy Spirit, help me. And he will help you. Yes, yeah. Doesn't mean it's not going to be a battle sometimes. Yeah. Because you're fighting the devil. He doesn't want you saved. He wants you to go to hell. He wants your life miserable. He doesn't want you to have a good marriage. He wants your kids to be crazy. He does. The enemy only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God, he wants you.
want you to have life Amen. and that more abundantly. Amen. Let's give him a praise. Oh, Lord. Lord. He told the church of Ephesus to repent. And he had the same messages for the church of Thyatira and Sardis. He doesn't tell them to cry. He doesn't tell them to moan or groan or regret. He tells them to repent. Yeah. What is repent? Turn around. Turn around. Don't go back. Go forward. Don't go back into your sin. Don't go back to the way you were living. Don't go back to being an alcoholic. Don't go back to being a drug addict. Don't go back to living in uh, sin and adultery and all kinds of perversion. Don't go back to that. Go forward. Amen. The old man is dead. Amen. You got to see yourself climbing out of those old skins. I got a new skin. I got a new temple. Amen. Hallelujah. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And the same spirit that dwells in you quickens your mortal body. Hallelujah. You are a carrier of God's presence. What's he seeing out your window? What's he hearing? What are you saying? Life and death is in the power of the tongue. But if the Holy Ghost is in me and his word's in me, the enemy comes at me one way, I'm going to tell him Amen. what the Holy Ghost says. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Said you're sick, you know, you're this, you're that, and uh. You know what the Bible says? He says he sent his word to heal me. The word lives inside of me. Hallelujah. I was wounded. He said I was wounded for your transgressions. I was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him and by his stripes. I'm healed. I'm healed. Don't waver. Stand upon the word of God no matter how you feel, no matter the circumstance. Don't waver. Stand upon the word of God. Faith. Faith can move the mountains. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith! Will he find faith on the earth when he returns? Yeah. Hallelujah. He tells them to repent. What is repentance? Repentance is a transformation that is accompanied by an outward change. And when you repent, there's always, say always, always, an outward change. Jesus says, make a decision, make a change. That's what Jesus is always saying to us. Many evangelists and pastors, including me, have used this verse to make an altar call. But really, it's not a salvation verse. Jesus is speaking to the church, and he's speaking to the saved people. This is sad. Every church in the book of Revelation, from Ephesus to Laodicea, he's speaking to the church. Who's the church? You are. I am. He's trying to talk to us. He says, look, I stand in Revelation 3.20. I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, what's he saying? If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will share a meal together as friends. Jesus was on the outside of the church. They were in the church going through their routine, doing all their religious duties, all their functions. The church was going through all the motions, but Jesus was not in the middle of the church. He was standing on the outside that's how far this church had drifted. Jesus was not even welcome inside the church. Jesus said, behold, and the Greek is I-D-O-U. 
bewilderment, shock, wow, amazement and wonder. Jesus was amazed by this himself. Wow, I'm not welcome. I'm on the outside of the church. I'm not even in there anymore. I'm outside. Behold, he said, I stand at the door. In fact, the Bible says he stands at the door. And that word at is epi. It means upon, at, right at, right there, right now. What was he doing there? Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And this is a definite article. This wasn't any door. It was the door. Jesus was pounding on the door. The Bible says he was pounding on the door of this church. The door of the church. He was pounding on the door of the church. The word door is thurin, ten thurin. Not just a door, but the door. The word thura pictures a large and solid door. And such doors were used to lock with a heavy bolt that slid through rings attached to the door and the frame. When such doors were opened, it provided access that was normally restricted. Hence, it denotes an opportunity. Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. The door is closed and Jesus is on the outside. The door is not just closed, it's bolted shut. But Jesus is giving them an opportunity. I stand at the door and knock. And the Greek word for knock is K-R-O-U-O. K -R -O -U -O. To knock, this means to incessantly beat on the door. He's beating on the door. He's pounding on the door to implore anyone to open the door. Jesus is still speaking this word to many churches today. Today, if you're a believer who has restricted access for the Lord to work in your life, he is standing at the door of your life and giving you a chance. He's pounding and he's pounding and he's pounding incessantly. This describes how much Jesus wants to be involved in his church. He said, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear, if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will share a meal with you as friends. What if, if, Christ is making an offer to anyone who will respond. He's given an invitation to anyone who will respond. He says, if any man, if any man hear, the word is T-I-S-T-I-S in Greek. Anyone, gender is neutral. Any man, any woman in this case, if anyone in the church or anyone who hears my pounding. Do you hear his pounding? Do you hear his knocking? He says, hear my voice. The Greek word is A-K-O-U-O. -O. It's where we get the word acoustics, to hear or perceive, to comprehend by hearing. The question rises, how does Jesus knock? How does Jesus knock? How do you know when Jesus is knocking at your door? Look, he says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hear my voice and open the door, he says, I will come in and I will share a meal. His voice is knocking. When someone is wayward, when a church is no longer in step with the Lord, when they become religious, Jesus is still speaking. He's still speaking to them all the time. And he's calling out, my sheep know my voice. Every time Jesus speaks, he's pounding and pounding at your heart's door. Incessant pounding, incessant speaking. Jesus says, is anyone, is there anyone, is there anyone that will hear my voice? Is there anyone who can hear the pounding? Will anyone even perceive 
believe that my voice is speaking and speaking and speaking and I'm pounding and I'm pounding and I'm trying to get through. And if anyone would open the door, if anyone would open the door, just give me an opening. In the Greek it says to make a way, to give entrance, to throw wide open. It pictures a grand and magnificent opening. If you just give him a chance, what will he do for you? What will he do? I want to ask you a question this morning. Has your fire gone out? Are you just coming to church because it's Sunday? I got to serve today. Got to go to church. Let me tell you, this morning, I hit snooze probably five times. <laughs> and I thought, oh man, I just want to sleep. But I'm the preacher. I had to get up. And I had a word for you today. See, I'm human. <gasps> but I feel such an honor. I want you to know Jesus like I know Jesus. I talk to him all day long. He's my best friend. I talk to him when I go to sleep. I talk to him when I wake up at four in the morning or three in the morning. I talk to him all the time. He's my best friend. He's with me all the time. He never leaves me. He talks to me. And the morning, this morning, he said, if you'll just give me 100%, you never know what I'm going to do for you. Are you just filling your Christian duties without the seal of God? Is he standing outside the door? Would you stand with me? Perhaps you're here today and you've never let the Lord in your heart. Some of you just maybe look through the peephole on there. Who's there? He's standing on the outside of the door. And perhaps you're here today and you've never let the Lord in your heart. Would you just close your eyes for a moment? Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart. But only you can open that door and let him in. And if you feel that Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart today, I want to pray with you to help you open that door for Jesus to come in. He can change your life. He can change your life. The enemy wants to destroy your life. But God wants to bless your life today. Hallelujah. Let the praise team sing, and then I want you to come forward, and we're going to say the sinner's prayer together. Amen. Oh, oh.
world's famous. We'll change you, change your DNA, change your thinking, change your anything's possible. What the enemy stole. What you're doing today is you're going back into the enemy's camp and you're taking back what was stolen from you. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. When you died on the cross, you proved you loved me. When you rose from the dead, you proved you had the power to transform me. I believe your word is true. I hear and feel you knocking and pounding at my heart's door. Today, I open my heart to you. I repent of my sin. And I believe you rose from the dead. In your word it says, I will be forgiven of every sin that I've ever committed. And according to your word, my name will be written down in the book of life. Every step that I take from this moment on, I know you will guide me with the help of the Holy Spirit. I will be zealous in serving you and I will do my best to be holy and acceptable unto him to prove your perfect will for my life. In Jesus' name, amen.